Great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to share today's center court stage with our partner, Matt Simmons. I'm Heather from Poets and Quants, and I'm welcoming four fantastic schools that we're going to talk today about careers and um, your MBA path. So we've got Linda Vo, who is the Senior Associate Director of Career, Coach, Career Co Coaching at UNC Kenina Flagler, Rebecca Cook at IU Kelly. She's the Executive Director, is that Career Services? That's right. Um, Craig, Craig, is it Petrus? Petrus. Mm -hmm. Craig Petrus, who's the Assistant Dean of Business Career Services at Florida Warrington, and Liz Chilla. Chilla? Great. Thank you. From Emory Goizueta. Um, you are the Senior Director of Career Management for the school. Mm -hmm. So let's begin with um, we talked about the programs and we will talk about the school in general um, in some of our other panels, but in terms of how, uh, tell us a little bit about your program and the career services component and how you serve the students. Um, let's start with Liz. Sure. Hi, everyone. Glad to have you here today. Um, so in terms of the career services at Goizueta Business School, I think probably the main driver for how we think about what we do is the size of our program. Um, uh, you know, we're here in a big city like Atlanta, which we really enjoy, and we stay very connected to alumni, uh, which is a big part of what we do at Goizueta. But um, I think having the small by design size has really allowed us to have very personalized career services. So um, the students that I work with on my team are our one year MBA program students and our two year MBA program students. Uh, and so we get to know them very well. All are assigned an individual career coach that they work with. All go through a required uh, professional development course that's taught by me and members of our team. Um, and all of that is done in a very kind of personalized and as relevant as possible way in order to make sure that everybody is getting um, uh, reps and, and practice and the things that are going to be most relevant to the recruiting process. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca. Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, so at Kelly, we have, we're similar in, in size, I think, to Guzueta, but um, we have a starting program called Me Inc. that all students come in a couple weeks early before starting their actual education, uh, where they really focus for two weeks on developing them. And we divide the class into small groups of about 15 to 20 students over about six different rooms and spend really spend the time delving into who they are, how are they going to tell their brand, what are their skills, interests, and values, and then also start working on interviewing, networking, all of those different pieces to begin to get them ready. Um, because their first week of school, besides classes, they start meeting with companies through some different programming that we have. So um, that's the beginning. And then we take that throughout the entire mostly first semester, and build on that every week with a required class uh, for about an hour and a half every Thursday, taught by our team. Uh, we have a team of three who coach our full-time MBA program. It's a two-year program. And um, that so this, it build our, this session of this class builds on everything we started in the Inc. And then that continues in the second, sec second semester as well of the first year, but it's really designed mostly for that first year. Um, and then second semester, continuing meeting the students where they're at, what are the programming that they need, and then again, as they move into a second year of the program, as well, we have job search groups, we have lots of different programming specific for second years, international students as well. So lots of very of handholding, a lot of very personalized approach, um, and the students seem to really enjoy it. Great, thank you. Uh, Craig, how about Florida? Absolutely. So similar to Liz and, and Rebecca in terms of the size of the program, we are um, a very a, a smaller program in size in terms of full-time MBA students. Um, we're about quality versus quantity, and, and with that comes that personalized approach to career and career readiness and, and talent acquisition. And so, you know, we work with hand in hand with those employers uh, in, in the vein of an executive recruiter. And, and so we're that, that talent acquisition consultants to are those employers with our students. And so we partner with those employers who want to source our MBA talent uh, into their organizations and really become a partner with them in that, in that talent acquisition discussion. Um, for us, we have two one-year programs, um, one that starts in May and one starts in June. Uh, that May program is for those non-business uh, undergraduate uh, degree students. Uh, that the first first month is that core business class, and then they'll join the the the, um, the other <clears throat> um, uh, program that'll start in June, which is an 11-month program 
for those students who do have a business undergraduate degree. That's just that I want that MBA in one year. Uh, but we also have that two year traditional MBA program that comes in the first year um, uh, and then does the summer internship and comes back. Uh, and so it's it's very, again, high quality, high touch program with us in, a, in our career team and career coaches. Uh, we also um, uh, take 60 or I'm sorry, 50 to 60 students year a, a year. Uh, to a national career fair. We supplement a good portion of the cost to go to a, a national career fair every year. Uh, we're in Gainesville, a uh, small town, uh, and so uh, we like to take our students where the companies are, uh, and that's uh, been a, a really good uh, um, uh, success for us over the past several years in terms of getting our students in front of those 300 um, Fortune 500 companies uh, to get those internships and full-time jobs. That's great. And did you say, when, when, when do you take them to that fair? Between first year or first year? Um, anyone is open, right? And and so it's it's uh, those that are looking for the full time uh, jobs as well as those interns. Um, all of our students are welcome to attend that. Mm -hmm. Great, great, yeah, great. So, um, Linda at UNC, um, tell us about your career services department. Sure. So our career services department here at UNC is called Career and Leadership. We're a big team of twenty plus broken out into two big groups. One is employer engagement relations and operations, managing our backend systems and keeping the lights on while also managing relationships with employers, bringing opportunities into the school for two students to connect. And then the other side of the team, um, which is the side I'm on, is the coaching team. Um, and so the career and leadership team here at UNC is, supports all of our five MBA programs. We have evening, weekend, Charlotte, online, and full-time. Um, and within the coaching team, we have one team of four that supports working professional and alumni, and then a team of six supporting all of our daytime, full-time students. Um, Similar to all of the represented schools here, we take a very individualized approach to our coaching, but everything we do revolves around our three-part career search model, which is know yourself, know the market, market yourself. So the idea is that you first have to think intrinsically about yourself, understand what you bring to the table, what your interests are, what your wants are, then understand what the market needs are, what the market has to offer, then putting that all together to market yourself and go after the career that you are looking to go after. Um, so that's just a little bit about how we approach things and how we're structured in order to support our students here. That's great. Thank you. So different schools, different sizes, different programs, but everybody here has high touch, personalized set of protocol for all of the students across the various programs. Sounds like. So one of the questions that we've been getting a lot at Poets and Quants, um, and I'm sure you have as well, is about AI and industry trends. And so the next question is going to be, um, what are some of the current industry trends that if you will, if you'd please talk about them, um, shaping the future of work and how they're likely to impact MBAs. Um, Linda, let's start back with you. Sure. Um, so I think there are a number of different things affecting the future of work, but the two that come to mind immediately for me is rapidly changing technology um, and increased um, importance and focus on so corporate social responsibility. I think that's been a long time coming, but a consistent theme and a want of our students to get involved in and give back. Um, from a rapidly changing technology perspective, of course, you mentioned AI. I think AI is new and in its infancy, but consistently changing. And something that our students and our programs will have to do is be able to quickly adapt to the changing nature of the technology. Um, and I know this is one of the questions um, that we get a lot is, well, how are you teaching your students to manage and work with AI? I think there are two parts of that. One is working with what we have now, but then also working with teaching our students to on being adaptable, being agile, and consistently being able to keep up with change. I think those are two very different qualities um, and skills that we need to teach our students. One is, I guess, softer, um, and then one is the hard side. 
So both very important. And then from a social responsibility perspective, I think consumers, everyone in the market, employers are demanding that social responsibility because we want to see a better world. Um, and so I, I believe that that will always be at the core of what we will need to focus our programs on and help our students get into as they approach their new jobs. Great, thank you. Um, Craig. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, very much agree with uh, Linda in in that um, social responsibility aspect, uh, generative AI. I think we're all managing it. I think we're all going to agree on a number of things here in terms of, of some industry trends. The ones that I'll point out, um, I think um, our, our economy is driven by data analysis, right? Uh, and so for our students to be able to um, look at a set of data, read it, manipulate it, and, and tell a story around it is really important. And so coming out of a, an MBA program, um, regardless of function or industry uh, that you end up in, you're going to have to know data and data analysis and, and, uh, and the story behind it. And so I think um, every company, um, uh, every organization is driven by that. Uh, and so industry trend is, is you're going to have to know that. And uh, the second one I'll say is, too, is, is really uh, revolves, uh, revolves around the customer experience value chain. Uh, I think um, both internally and externally, uh, our students are going to have to know who their customer is uh, and understand uh, the customer experience and how they can um, how they can manage it appropriately, uh, both internally at their organizations, but also externally. Uh, what they do and how they do it is ultimately um, impacting a customer. Um, and the more you know about that and how to manage that appropriately and navigate it is important too. So those are the uh, two, uh, two trends that I see too. Mm -hmm. Interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. Liz, how is, go ahead, how is Emory addressing these trends? We've got you on mute. Yes. Yes. How are we addressing these trends? I mean, I think, uh, you know, as Craig kind of mentioned, there's going to be a lot of similarities in terms of making sure that students feel as uh, adaptable with technology. I think that's going to be a trend kind of across all of our programs here, um, you know, both in how they're learning this within the classroom, but also the way that they're able to storytell and present these skills that they have as they're meeting with employers and making sure that they are prepared for the jobs that they're going into. Um, I, you know, I think that I was talking with students earlier today, like this is one of the important things about being able to do uh, in some cases, a two-year MBA program that requires an internship is that we get a lot of students coming into this program who may have less familiarity with some of this technology from the jobs they did before. Maybe they're coming from non-business paths before. And so a lot of what they're doing is being able to learn this in the classroom, understand it on the academic side, and then be able to apply it in these jobs and use that internship as a time to build that type of credibility. And so um, again, kind of touching on a piece that Craig just mentioned, you know, what we're doing in the Career Management Center to make students are prepared for the future of work is understand the storytelling aspect of this, is knowing the unique skill set that you bring, um, the familiarity that you have with how work is changing based on what you're learning in the classroom, be able to weave all that together into a story that's going to be relevant uh, and make sense and be impressive to the companies that you're interviewing with. And so I think, you know, as we're considering our roles in the career management centers of our various schools, it's not just understanding the future of work and being able to kind of harness it and, and learn it, but turn that into something that is marketable for the students as they're interacting with employers. So that's a big piece I think that that we're thinking about in our career management center for sure. That's great. And it seems like the, the, the pace that things are changing, it's requiring, you know, business schools are having to become as nimble as as the students that you're you're sending out to the world, you know, post degree. So um, Rebe Rebecca. I'll echo everything everybody else just said. <laughs> um, but the other things Anne would say, dealing with ambiguity, and because I think that's going to continue to grow, um, especially as AI involved is involved or other companies are changing and growing and figuring out how AI impacts them and what jobs will exist and what jobs won't exist going forward uh, for humans as opposed to machines. So really, as a student, being able to come in and, and deal with change and deal with that ambiguity is extremely important. So I think being able to help train students on there, at least become comfortable with it, because a lot of people hate ambiguity. Um, so I, th I think that's a big one. Um, and then really, I guess, just under, you know, the industry of choice for those students, really understanding how it's being impacted by technology and what is changing and then how the students can add value. And maybe that's adding programming languages or maybe it's um, 
as others mentioned, kind of the storytelling aspect of it. But I really, again, I think it's it's just the student really has to probably spend more time today understanding their areas of interest and what's driving those areas. Great. Well, so some of you also, you talked about um, social responsibility, sustainability, impact. These are also big words. And I've noticed that schools um, treat this differently, that sometimes some schools will weave this into curriculum and sometimes there will be separate classes. If you wouldn't mind, this is not on our, our approved, not approved, but our list of questions to cover. But as you were speaking, it reminded me, and this is something that I find interesting and that we do get questions from our readership. So programmatically, does career services work with the faculty in incorporating and weaving this into the curriculum overall, or are there separate classes at your schools that address these issues? Um, Craig, let's start with Florida. Yep, no, absolutely. Um, from the most part, um, our business career services office um, does not necessarily, on the MBA side, weave into the curriculum any of our uh, programming or, or content. Uh, we're, you know, pure uh, career coaching, if you will, um, and career development. Um, um, I will say our MBA program specifically, though, has a, a, a separate business unit for professional development, uh, where it's a it's a it's an add on to the overall student experience here at UF, in which uh, they're getting uh, those things um, such as Liz and, and Rebecca talked about about storytelling workshops, um, business improv, um, 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 and, and some of that uh, program is is separate, um, uh, is developed separately by a, a director uh, of professional development here in the MBA program. So, so they'll do those, those types of programmings, but it's separate from uh, career services. Great. Mm -hmm. Liz, um, how about it? Uh, Emery? Sure. I mean, I, I think that there is the way that um, it works in the curriculum and as part of the activities and what we're doing in the Career Management Center are certainly related um, in the sense that in the Career Management Center, we're seeing students that care more about kind of the purpose and the impacts behind their work. And I think that that reflects in the ways that we think, you know, we as a school think about the curriculum and the activities that students are interested in doing. Some of that is formalized where, you know, the CSR focus or other areas of impact related work are um, part of the curriculum. For example, we had a new diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, related concentration that students could focus on within the program. Um, we have nonprofit consultants as part of the activities that students can do. And I think all of this is kind of giving students um, access to uh, and an ability to kind of focus on the greater purpose of the work that they, they're doing. Um, and that reflects in the goals that they're going to be talking about with our office. So I think it's just kind of like a, a natural progression of this is what students are interested in. We're preparing them for those careers and we're making sure that uh, they have access to those types of opportunities as they're learning more about it. All right. Thank you. Um, Rebecca or Linda, do you have, would you like to comment? Sure, I can in. Um, similar to others, it's mostly run through the academic side or the programming side. Um, we have a sustainability certificate that students can earn through different classes that they take and experiences. We spend a lot of time on experiential learning as well, whether that's in, we have these things called academies for first years where there are six specialized areas such as um, consumer marketing, business marketing, strategic finance, et cetera. And each of those have a spring project, sometimes working with nonprofits, sometimes working with for-profit companies, but experiential learnings where they can work with the companies on areas such as sustainability and DEI. Um, also, we have a program called Globase, which is uh, global. It's basically, they, they study domestically for, six, for eight weeks and then go in country to four different countries around the world uh, for two weeks where they're working with nonprofits or for, again, small for-profit companies, but in, in various countries in Africa, in South America, and, and in Southeast Asia. And it's, it's a great opportunity for the students to really learn about inter, oh, inter global uh, right. commerce, but, um, but also sustainability practices, because it actually turns out a lot of these companies that we work with do focus on sustainability. Yeah. Yep. Good. Thank you. Linda. Yeah. Um, here at UNC, we actually have a center for um, sustainable enterprise. It's called the Ackerman, Ackerman Center of Excellence in Sustainability. Um, the Ackerman Center, it's called ACES. Actually, ACES has their own faculty and staff that support sustainability curriculum. Um, 
experiential learning and even connectivity between students and industry in the area of sustainability. They are also very involved, as are we in the Career Center, with the Student Club Net Impact in helping them to build curriculum for students in how to succeed in and secure jobs in the area of sustainability. Um, so in that way, we keep connected and help students to pursue those types of careers and guide them in how to um, get in touch and connected to opportunities. Great. Thank you. Well, before I go on to the next question, I want to remind our audience that we are live here. They can ask questions. We have a QA and a um, open and we love and appreciate your input and questions. Um, so now's your chance and we'll check in again before the end of the, um, the webinar. But um, so, so these, these folks listening and watching are, you know, they're either going to just, they're going into some personal professional development, their career switchers. Um, maybe they just want to level up in their career, but in terms of, so in terms of valuing the MBA and its return on their investment. Um, this is a question we're also asked a lot at Poets and Quants. Um, what factors should they consider when considering, or the factors that they consider when thinking about the value of getting an MBA and the time and the money it's invested? Um, Rebecca, let's start with you. Sure. Um, obviously, time and money is important. <laughs> do you want to go full time? Do you want to go in, um, you know, part time? Whatever that looks like online. Um, but a lot of it really, I think, is the intangibles and it's the connections, it's the network. It's um, what are you really trying to get out of an MBA, especially if you're career switching? I think a full-time program is great in that sense because you do, in most cases, you know, if you go to a two-year program, you do have that internship opportunity to really test out of if you like where you think you want to go or you don't. And I'd much rather have somebody figure that out during an internship and then come back to school and say, hey, I actually didn't like this. So now I need to pivot to something else as opposed to going into it full time without really knowing. Um, but so a lot of it is it's that learning opportunity and building up on their knowledge and skill sets. But again, it's it's that networking piece of it. I think that is so extremely important because you build a, such a close relationship with your classmates and you keep that relationship going and you can always call on them for questions or uh, a lot of times we have stu our former students interacting with each other, creating deals and, you know, and selling product and, and you really never know where people end up. And I've, I'm an MBA from Kelly and I have a, one of my friends, one of my classmates is a CEO of Eli Lilly right now. Cool. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, it just, you really don't know where people will end up, but it's, it's kind of fun to see where they go. And it, these are people you can connect with for the rest of your life. So value of the network. Great. Um, Linda. I'm kind of echoing on the value of the network. I was speaking to an alum recently who was an international student when he was here, and he was talking about how, as an international student coming to the country for the first time, the people that he met in the MBA are his friends. That, it, that This is only network here in the U.S., and they have been his friends since the MBA 10 years ago through where he is now in his career, and that is his network and his, his close group. Um, and that was very, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but it's just so heartwarming to hear that this experience can be so touching and build on those relationships so much. Um, but going back to the question about ROI, I think, um, you know, prospective students can think about it from a professional growth perspective and a personal growth perspective. What are you going to take away from it personally? What are you going to learn from it? Whether it be, you know, increased business knowledge or the connections and people that you get out of being here and going through the classes. What can you learn from the classmates that you have that have had diverse experiences and from the faculty members who have either been doing research in this forever or, or who are industry experts themselves? Um, from a professional perspective, what career are you going to go to next? Of course, there's the salary benefits and sign-on bonuses, what have you. That's the easy part of the quantitative ROI. But what can you gain? What impact can you make from the next step that you're going to take and in the future? Um, so I'd encourage students to think of the ROI from a professional and personal growth perspective, short-term and long-term, because those are all factors that go into that ROI. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, it, uh, I think Linda 
for me, hit it right there uh, on the on the head. Uh, I talk a little bit about this during orientation. Um, you know the, that ROI on on your degree or your experience, and and in, for uh, for the most part, a lot of these students are coming back to school after two or three or four years. Um, and uh, whether they move on to get a PhD or not, um, it's their almost last time in 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 college, if you will, right? And so when you think uh, about the value of an MBA. Um, you know, Linda kind of mentioned this in terms of I, I really challenge our students to get the ROI around the overall student experience. And what I mean by that is um, academically, right? Take advantage of every academic opportunity that you're going to get here during your one or two years with us. Um, take advantage of the career experience that you're going to get uh, as being part of the program, um, as well as the social aspect of it too. Uh, take advantage of the social experience, being around and inside of a classroom uh, of students representing different industries, functions, um, 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 diverse set of, of students uh, for from all over the world. Uh, and so that social experience too is, is part of that ROI. Um, and then you have experimental learning, right? Take advantage of those case competitions uh, and those other opportunities to get involved in programming outside of the classroom where you can gain those, uh, those uh, uh, tangible skills that the, the panel has spoken about uh, throughout, uh, throughout our discussion today. Uh, and then that professional development experience, right? And, and so all of those, you know, really kind of come back to the overall ROI. Um, and, 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 I, and as I like to say too, um, are you leaving with a bigger network than you came uh, into the program with? A huge, huge part of it, uh, which Linda and, and Rebecca also said. So it's holistically thinking about the, the, the experience when, when you, in terms of ROI. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that over and over again, it's the value, the value of the network mm -hmm. that is an intangible or tangible um, gain over time. And Liz? Sure. Um, I, I'll build on two things that were mentioned. Uh, one that Linda mentioned, kind of the personal and professional growth. I think that one piece that comes from that is job satisfaction because you know yourself well and you know what you're good at. And so when I think about a student who really feels like they got the return on their investment, it's that they're not going into a job that they can do well, but a job that they're really satisfied in. And so we hope that in a career management center, we can help facilitate that a little bit in terms of reflecting on their values, their goals, um, you know, and, and hoping to help align them with a career that would allow that to happen. And then I want to build upon one piece that Rebecca mentioned in terms of connections. I, I think that we all know connections means the great network that you're going to get out of the MBA, but connections can also mean connections with employers. And the MBA is a unique time period in your career where employers will be coming to you. They will be sharing job postings with the schools. They may be doing presentations on campus. That is something that you're not going to get in your job search outside of an MBA. And so making sure as you're evaluating programs that those connections that you're able to make through um, alumni or employers that are specifically coming to recruit you as part of the school is such an important of being able to say that this was worth my time. Um, so again, that, that satisfaction in the job and the connections that you're making beyond just the, uh, the alumni network is, is really crucial. That's great. Thank you. We, you know, um, we created this pre MBA networking festival for new admits to, um, to business school. And that was one thing that, you know, I learned when I came into quotes and but most newly admitted MBAs don't know is that when they select their school and they go to campus, they will start talking about careers and meeting, uh, meeting recruiters very, very soon after hitting campus. And um, I mean, I've heard today, maybe two weeks, so sometimes it's six weeks, but um, so that's, that's surprising. So how much, how much thought do you think that students or seekers should do about their career before they come to campus? How much exploring, if, um, if you wouldn't mind answering that, because um, you know, you could go in thinking that you wanna be in banking um, or let's say, let's not pick that one, um, technology, but actually you might prefer a role in consulting um, where you could, you know, work within different tech companies and solve different problems and be part of different teams. So um, if you wouldn't mind, um, the question is, how well should somebody get to know what they want um, before they start their program uh, because of the, the rapid pace that recruiters start knocking on their doors? Um, Liz, let's just start with you. Sure. Um, what I tell students is that I want them to do as much reflection as possible before they come into the MBA to know the things that they 
they like, what they don't like, that you know they want to expand upon in terms of their skill set, maybe the parts of their job that they did before the MBA that they absolutely don't want to do again, so that when they're starting to evaluate different types of opportunities, they can do through do so through the lens of the things that they know that they enjoy and that they know that they want to continue doing. Um, I don't think every student has to have it all figured out by the time they get here because for some students, they may not have taken a finance class before the MBA, or they may not have taken a marketing class before the MBA. And part of you know, being in a program is a chance to explore some of those things. That being said, I think that as much research that you can do beforehand to make sure that you can understand maybe where you will be best aligned is going to be helpful when employers start to interact with you as early as possible. So one of the things that we do on our side, as an example, is um, we have webinars that take place in the summer after students are admitted, but before they actually get to campus that talks through um, who different career paths could be a good fit for based on what they're interested in and what the timeline typically looks like for those paths. You know, how does marketing differ from investment banking? Um, and so hopefully students can attend some of those if they're exploring and then be able to use the information that they've learned based on the reflection that they've done and come in with a little bit of a plan on what they're going to do. And of course, once they get there, we'll be able to guide them through that plan and that process. Great. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, anything to add? I'm sure totally agree with Liz. I think also what we're seeing is there's a lot of things that are happening earlier and earlier that we can't control. <laughs> I wish we could, but uh, you have a lot of summer programming for like brand camps and things. If you want to go into consumer goods, you might want to apply to some of those things and those will happen before you ever start your education. And you have Forte and consortium and different, again, different events that if you're part of those groups, you're interviewing at those conferences. And so you have to be ready. So I think for all of us, most likely is we all start training for that well before students ever physically step foot on campus. Um, you also have certain industries that are hiring early and earlier, such as investment banking, such as certain consulting areas. And unfortunately, after I think after COVID, a lot of those companies said, oh, we can do this whenever we want and move stuff earlier. Um, but it forces those students to make decisions faster. And they don't give them really extended long time periods to, to decide. So it's, I love Liz's comment, you know, we want them to come here. We want them to explore. We want them to look at different areas, but yet some of those companies are forcing earlier decisions. So we have to make sure this, the flip of that is we have to make sure students are ready. Right. Thank you. Linda, Linda, go ahead. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I want to echo everything that Liz and Rebecca have already said, things are getting pushed earlier and earlier. We do want students to explore, but I think all schools recognize that this is happening and are building and programming to make sure that students are ready. We start interacting with our students going to consortium and forte as early as late April so that they know what they need to do, their resumes are ready, and they have conversations with our coaching team to start thinking about how to prepare and what they can do to best utilize their time at those conferences. We also offer um, um, coaching to any students who wants to do it in June before they step foot on campus for orientation. Luckily for us, our orientation timeline is pretty long too. We've got a three week orientation. Career is a big part of that and it allows students to use that time to explore. Um, the schools also, I know we do, and I know other schools do too, try to, as much as possible, push back on some of those deadlines that the employers are giving to students when they do offer early offers. So say a student gets an offer within the summer timeframe, we do ask that employers give students until at least December so that they can take those finance classes or marketing classes and understand if, if this is maybe a good fit for me. Um, so I think in all in all, there still is some time to explore. Uh, the time that students have to actually apply to jobs during the on-campus cycle is mid-October. So they have some time to engage with recruiters and use that opportunity to learn and explore, not necessarily make a decision right now. But my advice is to narrow, to explore and narrow because you cannot spread yourself too thin and try to explore every single thing when you get here. Uh, my advice to students when the fall starts is to narrow to two and a half paths is what I call it. <laughs> two is enough, three, maybe too many. So somewhere in the middle of that. 
Well, thank you. This is great. This, this is great advice. Um, Craig, do you, does Warrington have any pre MBA, you know, start date programs or suggestions for students? Or any advice? Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. And, and um, we're lucky enough here, uh, the Career Services Office, myself, uh, as well as our, our direct MBA career coach for a full time program, we sit on the admissions committee. Uh, and, and so we interview um, uh, all of the students that are considered for our full time program. And so some of those discussions are happening early, uh, even at the admissions process, admissions interview. So we start planting some seeds about a potential career paths that they might be interested in based upon the feedback that we get from them. Um, and some of the dialogue that we have. Uh, and so it really kind of starts there too as well to help them um, get a little bit of an idea of what they potentially would want to do and, and what they could get out of a UF MBA. Um, but once they're here, right, once they're, they're, they're committed to the program, we do do some summer programming in terms of career coaching if they want to, to get ready for uh, those, uh, those summer brand camps or those fortes or, or those other uh, events that uh, the, the summer events for pre-MBA experiences. Uh, we do have a number of those students, uh, of our students that do take advantage of those programs. So we will initiate coaching earlier. Uh, we also have uh, two other things. One thing is called a summer sprint. Uh, it's a series of workshops through a, a, a course, a, um, um, a course of a couple weeks in terms of getting our our students ready uh, for that fall recruiting season. And so that's, that's those career workshops of resume interviewing, um, um, job search marketing plan, etc. And so the summer sprint will take care of the live workshops. But we also have an online component too via Canvas. And so we have a career course that is an opt-in, um, really kind of mandatory for our full-time MBAs in terms of taking that prior to them getting here. Uh, so that when they do hit a live career coach, they're 75, 85% there to have a really robust conversation when they get live coaching. So it's an online Canvas course um, um, that you can um, play as you go, if you will. Um, but we hope that we, we hope that they're they're completed that course prior to them hitting campus. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, it's been really fun to learn more about what your schools are doing in terms of career services for the students um, before campus, especially. Um, so we only have about seven minutes left. So I'm going to do one more call to the people who are with us live to see if there's any questions. Um, but there's two things I want to touch on before we go. Um, one is special special um, groups for special demographics, military, international, um, do your schools offer career services specifically for these groups? Or I guess it's customized person to person, which you've already said. Um, but I find um, military applicants, you know, those transitioning back into to, uh, civil life um, would find this interesting to, to hear about them. Any, Rebecca? Sure. Go back to Rebecca. Um, so yes, in answer to your question, yes. <laughs> uh, we offer programming specifically for all the different de different areas of demographics, but so like for the vets, for example, the MBA vet conference is happening tomorrow. Yeah. Um, and so really get, you getting, working with those students who are going, attending, because there actually is a virtual session this year as well, besides the in-person, but getting them ready to go and making sure that their resumes are up to speed. I mean, they had to have their resumes posted weeks ago. Um, so in practicing interviewing, because a lot of them are already having interviews set up to, for those at conference, same at National Black, same as Prospanica and, and Rumba, and really trying to help with each of those students groups be successful in, if they go, if they choose to go to those conferences. Um, also with international students is we have a lot of specialized international student programming to help those students throughout the, throughout their entire two years in the program, just because there's lots of other, you know, visa issues and, and sponsorship and all of the different areas that they are working through that the domestic students don't have to. Um, but really, again, trying to work with each of those students individually, but then as groups to help make sure they're all successful. Great. Thank you. Uh, Linda? Specific programs? Yeah, I'm happy to touch on that. So during orientation, we actually have identity-based sessions for those two very specific groups, veterans and international students. Um, from a veteran's perspective, I've got a veteran on my team that is a career coach and 
a past full-time MBA and he can speak to his experience as a veteran um, and an MBA student. And he does a special program on debunking the myths of veteran recruiting, which I think is really great. And then for our international students, um, as Rebecca mentioned, there are a lot of different things that international students have to do and assimilate to. But what we try to do in our orientation session is help students understand the reality of recruitment in the US. Um, so we'll talk about sector by sector, what the numbers look like, what sectors are more open to sponsorship, um, and help students understand how to overcome common challenges that we've seen international students have during their recruiting process. We are also, as a career coaching team, very involved and connected with all of our student clubs. So we support um, our international student experience. VP of International Student Experience and our International Business Association with building programming for international students throughout the year. Um, and then similarly with vets, connecting with the Veterans Club and continuing to so support them in building programming too. Um, Rebecca had mentioned MBA vets. We send coaches to many of the diversity conferences and MBA vets is one of them that we send a coach and an employer engagement to, person to, in order to support our student body. Great, thank you. Uh, Liz. I feel like I could co-sign almost everything that Linda just said, um, especially because this is all on our mind right now because the, the these diversity conferences have recently happened in terms of sending people from the school to go support students that are attending conferences like the National Black MBA, the Vets Conference, which is in Atlanta, just coming up in a couple of days, um, Ramba, uh, all of that has happened recently. And um, we worked closely with the students to prepare for those. And then the other thing that I will echo is that um, making sure that current students are involved in a lot of that preparation. So a lot of times for international students, for vets, um, that hearing from other students who have gone through that process, who have translated military experience onto a resume or can talk about maybe the cultural differences when it comes to networking in the U.S. versus what it looked like in their home country, using the current students as a resource, usually through the student clubs, but in some cases just really engaged, enthusiastic students that want to help. Um, are, are part of developing programming that feels like it's going to be speaking to exactly what the first year students need as they're learning about areas that they may be unfamiliar with. Great, thank you. Greg? Sure, absolutely. All of the above, uh, to be honest with you. And, and uh, really, in, in particular, um, uh, we're very similar to uh, uh, to Linda's structure. We have a former UF MBA alum who's now a career coach on our team who is a vet, right? And so he uh, really leads our charge for our MBA vets uh, in, in all things career readiness. And so he will be representing uh, us and, and UF MBA uh, at the Veterans MBA Conference uh, this week, I believe. Uh, and he, any of our MBA vets who happen to be full-time students or even our part-time program, our professional MBAs, uh, he will take on those individuals too uh, as well and, and do career coaching there so um so wanted to point that out but everything agree with everything in terms of what we do and how we do it in terms of the uh, the diversity conferences and and uh, and uh, and supporting those conferences with our students great thanks craig well i'm going to start with you for the last remarks just give us some advice for any mba applicant be any advice you want um, to mm -hmm. offer and how people can reach you and if they can reach you directly if they have any more questions after today's event so absolutely. Uh, so my advice to um, uh, potential MBA students that are vetting out programs, you know, when you're when you're part of the interview process, um, we're interviewing you, but take the time to interview us, right? Um, ask those pointed uh, questions about academics, about the experience, about career. Um, you, you know, uh, this is a, an important decision in your life, uh, and and we want you to make the best decision that you you can. Uh, and so, um, just like we're interviewing you, interview us, right? Um, ask Ask those great questions uh, and making sure that you're making the informed and best decision that you can when you're choosing a program. Um, you can reach me, um, uh, craig.petris at warrington.ufl.edu. Um, if you Google me, you can find me online. <laughs> so great. great, thank you. Um, Liz? Or, um, 
One of the things I, I would not be a career services person if I did not say that use LinkedIn as a tool uh, in order to be able to evaluate MBA programs. I think this is something that this is a piece of advice that I always give to incoming and prospective students that LinkedIn is a tool that any student can use and how it could be beneficial to you is if you do have an area of interest that you're thinking about when it comes to your career, whether it's consulting or tech or maybe even a specific company, you can look to see which um, graduates of the MBA programs you're considering are working there. And those are likely going to be such an important part of your network as you're thinking about maybe recruiting with those companies when you come into that school. And so um, as you're doing your research, as you're trying to decide which program is going to be a good fit, know a little bit about who your network would be coming into that program. Um, and so that's a that's a small piece of advice, a small specific thing that I think is good for anybody at this stage to consider. Uh, and in terms of getting in touch with me, I'm, I can put my email in the chat, but it's e c h i l l a um, e chilla at emory.edu. Thank you, thank you, Rebecca. Closing advice for applicants and sure. can they contact you? Um, Craig and I totally echo Craig and Liz and everything they said, but I, I get, it's fit. It's you know kind of like the same as you're looking for a job. It's figure out who you as you talk to different schools. Where do you feel you fit in? Where do you like the people? Where do you like talking to them? And is it you know really just figure out where do you want to spend one or two years of your life? <laughs> and because it's important, you're going to be spending a lot of time with these people. So really, I'd say the fit, and then also building on what Liz was saying is really reach out to alums, find out you know get their feedback, get their get their thoughts on the program. And they'll tell you the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever. But it's, um, but again, it's a very useful tool and it just really gets, gives someone a good understanding of what a program is really like, uh, as opposed to just the marketing materials. Cause we'll all say we're awesome. <laughs> we are, but <laughs> it's, um, but really, I think again, it's talking about the fit. Um, and yeah, people can definitely reach out to me. It's Reb Cook. So it's R-E-B-C-O-O-K at iu.edu. Great, thank you. Linda? All right. Last um, words. Last words from the last person. I echo everything that everyone has said here. Um, I, I'd say have lots of conversations because it is all about fit. I'd say it's about the culture, the people, the learning opportunities, and the opportunities for career advancement. I also think that like everything, there are trade-offs. So there may be programs that have more of something than something else for you. And you have to determine based on your list of priorities, the rankings um, as to where some of these schools slot in. I'm a very methodical person. So, you know, <laughs> um, but have lots of conversations, see who you jive with and determine which school is the best fit for you based on your criteria. Um, I'm going to give the email to our career and leadership inbox because I'm not always the right person to get in touch with, but we will triage based on the question that comes in. Our career and leadership inbox is career underscore leadership at keenan-lagler.unc.edu. Great. Thank you so much. Well, and a, a big thank you to all of you today for taking this time out of your day and sharing with us and our audience. Um, wishing you all a great week and to our attendees thank you for joining and please come back and visit us at poetsequence.com and don't hesitate to ask us any questions anytime <laughs>